How are we doing there, Sean? Uh, it's not allowing me to go to the Facebook page, so just give me a second. Okay, maybe it's... <laughs> I can see people send me messages. So nice to see everyone. Uh, you know, this uh, pandemic is such a crazy time, and and uh, so hi to Jeremy and James. And thanks for the messages there. And uh, yeah, it's nice to see you guys too. Yeah, I don't know why Nigan, but it's not allowing me to put it on our uh, on our Facebook page. Um. Okay. Just like we tried last night, it doesn't, uh, doesn't look like it's. it's but you've got time. the you've got those ellipsis buttons, and it says live, go live on Facebook. Yeah, but it's not giving me the option to post as uh, as native studies. Hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to record it anyways, and we have a pretty good crowd here, so let's uh, let's do that, and then you know I, I can always upload it onto the Facebook page, following. So um, uh, we'll we'll have to ensure that the the like right now the security settings don't let me put it on Facebook, so. That says to me that something's going on. Uh, you've made sure that I'm the, like, can you make me, you've already made me the co-host, right? Yeah, let me see, uh, let me see if that's what you guys. Yeah, because uh, uh, anything, I'd have to go out of the room and then come back, which would be a bit of a headache. So let's maybe just get started and then we'll just. Okay. okay. All right, so we'll just get started here. So bonjour everyone, uh, welcome to the Indigenous Comics Symposium. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to see everyone and uh, particularly a pleasure to uh, see my fellow coordinators. Uh, I'm coming to you live from Treaty One territory right here in Manitowabo, Winnipeg, and uh, of course the homeland of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, as well as the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oja Cree, and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, I, wherever you're coming from, whatever territory that you're on, I hope that you uh, acknowledge and recognize our beautiful relatives all across Turtle Island and uh, and the uh, wonderful spaces that we all share and the uh, the gifts that we all share with one another. Uh, my name is Nigon Sinclair. So bonjour, Nigon Way Magadaduk, Nigon Way with the Dishna Kos, Namagoshin Dodem. So I'm an associate professor at the University of Manitoba in the Department of Native Studies, and uh, it's my honor to be able to bring to you this plenary, the opening plenary for the uh, Indigenous Comics Symposium, which began as a, a bit of a kernel idea through a phone call that Kateri Ekowenzi Dam, my colleague at the University of Toronto Department, uh, University of Toronto Scarborough Department of English, uh, who uh, just phoned me randomly and had this idea, which then turned into this. And so, uh, so we really credit her for having the vision of uh, the idea of, of first starting this off. And, and we've uh, picked up two amazing organizers along the way, Sean and Lucas, and you'll meet them in just a minute. But I wanna tell you a little bit about the uh, Indigenous Comics Symposium for today. And uh, so today is uh, your opportunity to, if you get a chance to sort of drop in on different sessions, and see the Indigenous Comics Symposium. Uh, we have, uh, I think it's one, two, three, four, five different events that are happening throughout today. Uh, this is the, of course, our poster, uh, and uh, you can catch all these different amazing writers and thinkers and uh, theorists as you hear throughout the day about Indigenous comic books. Um, the, uh, the, our day will be a very full one uh, because what will be, uh, this is our opening plenary at 10 a.m. and then at 11.15 we'll have, we're having a conversation with David Alexander Robertson. At 12.30 we'll be discussing in, independent Indigenous comics with uh, Tasha Spillett, Natasha Donovan and Neil Shonakopel. And then at 2.30 we'll be, these are all central time by the way, uh, we'll be Indigenizing Marvel Comics with Kyle Charles, Wisha Alberta and Darcy Little Badger. And then at 6 p.m. we have a plenary showcase with a whole bunch of contributors from this place, 150 years retold. And you can check out the Facebook page for all the group. I think there's, we have over 11 of us that are, 10 or 11 of us that are coming onto that panel for tonight. It's gonna be an amazing day. And uh, it's a real honor to be able to spend a little bit of time with you. I want to introduce you to my fellow coordinators. But before I do that, I just want to thank our partners, our partners in this event, which is the University of Toronto Scarborough Department of English, uh, the University of Manitoba Department of Native Studies, 
uh, the University of Manitoba Institute for the Humanities and uh, High Water Press and Kigodon's Press. We've all come together uh, to provide book giveaways for today, to provide uh, the honorariums for all the speakers, as well as the uh, billions of dollars that we use to rent these rooms, these wonderful conference rooms that we're now being hosted. Oh, sorry, it's we, we didn't have to pay anything for that. So Zoom. So we want to say thank, thank all of you that that had to go on to online and then dial in for today, and we really appreciate it. Um, we want to uh, uh, I want to introduce you to my fellow coordinators before we begin. They're each going to have a few uh, discussion points on Indigenous comic books. I'm going to start it off. So I'm Anishinaabe from Pegwis First Nation. Uh, I'm also a, a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press, and so some of you may have read my columns, and I uh, write those twice a week, as well as I, uh, I do a number of other things in graphic novels. So I, I'm a participant on This Place, 150 Years Retold, as well as several other comic books uh, involving graph uh, the co graphic classics, for example, or Sovereign Traces. I've written uh, graphic stories in those as well, so uh, you can check that out. But uh, enough about me. My fellow co collaborator and coordinator, who I've been longtime friends with and uh, always uh, want to emulate more of is a Kateriak Wenzi Dam, who is Anishinaabe from the uh, Chip. I just want to make sure I get that right. Um, Chip was the Nawish, right? Because close. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I was sort of close there. Um, just because I mean, everyone always says Kate Croker, so I want to make sure I, I say the right name properly. And uh, Kateri, of course, is a colleague of ours, uh, assistant professor at the University of Toronto Department of English. Uh, she's also the publisher of Kigadon's Press. Uh, you can see Kateri's work in, in numerous anthologies, as well as her own uh, poetry uh, and stories, uh, including those at High Water Press and, and international anthologies as well on Indigenous erotica. Uh, Kateri, it's really nice to see you. It's great to be here. I'm really excited for today. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, wonderful. So we'll, we'll hear from Kateri in just a minute. Uh, but my, my other uh, partner for this event is my colleague, Sean Carlton who is a brand new assistant professor at the, uh, he's sparkling just out of the package, you know, sort of a sparkling new pro assistant professor at the University of Manitoba, Sean Carlton, coming to us from previously Mount Royal University. Uh, Sean's interests involve representation, stereotypes, uh, also discussing around indigenous uh, nationhood and talking about how good allyship. And so Sean is an amazing collaborator. Uh, it's a real honor to have you here, Sean. I know you're doing a lot of the tech throughout today, so we'll hear from you in just a little bit, uh, talking a little bit about representation, but it's nice to see you, man. Oh, <laughs> oh I just get a wave. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Great, nice to see you, Sean. Uh, my, our, our fourth partner, uh, who has just been so generous and so kind with his time and efforts, is uh, Lucas Tromley, who's from the University of Manitoba Institute of the Humanities. Uh, Lucas uh, has been just instrumental in helping us get funding for this event, also has been very helpful for us to be able to coordinate. And, and as we discovered throughout the process, he asks all the questions we forget about. So Lucas, thanks so much for coming. Nice to see you, man. Thanks, guys. I'm really happy to be here. Okay, wonderful. Um, so let's get started. So why are we here? Uh, we're talking about uh, comic books and we're talking about graphic novels. And so uh, what I like to do is uh, I'll start off by just speaking a little bit about uh, what it is that comic books are involving, like what it is that we are trying to talk about for today. And so I'm just going to share uh, uh, and, and if you just give me just a just a Oh, here we go. Okay, um, if you just give me a brief second here. Okay, uh, actually, I'll just, uh, uh, I'm just going to share my screen. And uh, so if we look right here, uh, what are comic books? Uh, what are uh, graphic novels? And of course, what they are is they are, uh, let's make sure I can, there we go, I drew a full screen here. Uh, comic books are sequential art, and they bring together a number of things uh, in terms of understanding what it is that we're trying to uh, do when we're talking about uh, graphic novels. They, they really do, uh, they're a sequential comic book form and they talk about combining or juxtaposing text and image together. Uh, there's many different conventions that we can talk about within comic books and I won't get too theoretical around you, but, but one of the things that I really love when we talk about comic books 
is just around the notion of image and text together and what it is that they can go. So you're going to hear a lot of terms today. Uh, and those terms may be speaking about the kind of ins and outs of comic books, things like captions, and thought bubbles, and of course, uh, sound effects and gutters. Uh, we're going to talk when we talk about David Robertson, for example, we're going to talk a lot about the gutter and the theory of the gutter and what does that involve. Um, so just so that if you're coming new to comic books, these are kind of the things that are being spoken about. Um, and one of the things that comic books really do is they really kind of investigate us to think about what it takes to be a story. What, how do we tell a story? How do we break down time? How do we innovate? How do we create and uh, tell that story powerfully? But when we're really talking about comic books, graphic novels, sequential art, we're really talking about traditional Indigenous literature in its fullest form, in its longest form, in its most sovereign form. Because if we look to the ways in which Indigenous peoples have been telling stories for thousands and thousands of years, uh, we've always told stories with image and text and, and those kinds of, sometimes that text is, is spoken, but most oftentimes the, the images that we have always used have texts that have always been in operation. There's kind of this illusion and this, uh, this, this statement that's often out there that native cultures are oral cultures, but we're really not. We're very written cultures. And we just have to think of writing as something other than these, you know, kind of squiggly lines on the page. Like that is not the only way that literature operates. In fact, the word liter literature refers to litera, uh, it refers to letters. And so if we talk about what it is that, that, that me, a graphic texts represent, they really represent thought and action. And there's a really great book you can read about this, which makes the argument that uh, Indigenous peoples have always had written text. You still have to think beyond kind of Roman orthography or, or written English speech, uh, because they're not, we're not, you know, English is not the only form of literature that is in operation. People have been writing for tens of thousands of years all across the world in different communities, different cultures. And if we look towards some of the uh, traditional Indigenous texts that are in operation throughout Turtle Island, we start to see that it is everywhere. The library, as it were, would be the entirety of the land and the space of Turtle Island. Um, there's a really great text, if you can see, of the Anasazi people, which are people sort of uh, bordering uh, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Colorado. And, and they, they've been writing texts, you know, about experience and about what you can see. Uh, this is a much bigger view right here. But if you zoom in, you can see some of the text, things you can see, things you can unsee. And if you zoom out and uh, people have traced out this text, uh, you can see here, it's talking about ceremony, it's talking about animals and life and, and the sacred or what we call the incorporeal, the things that are spiritual or mysterious, and the incorporeal, very real in the material. And if you look at this image right here and you start to see, you start to notice a few things. You notice that there's a certain way to read, there's like, you know, right to left, but then also a left to right image at the top. So it kind of draws your eyes in kind of a circular pattern like this. And then you can also see that there are images throughout the text that are kind of telling stories that are kind of mini stories within the story. And you also notice that there are certain elements of the story that are talking about uh, parts that perhaps are mysterious. Like on the left hand side, you can see an alligator, for example, with a human hand, or you can see a uh, a being with only one arm with long horns. And then in the right hand side, you see just very everyday things. You see an owl, you see a deer, you see giving birth over here, you see a lodge over here. And then you're like, so that seems like on the right hand side of the things that we see and the things that we don't see. But yet you've got this dividing line in the middle with these little air pockets. And you've got this image right here of someone who can see on both sides. And you're like, so we start to realize that we're really being invited to, to think of a story in multiple directions, multiple ways of reading, and probably the most important of all is we've got a gutter right in the middle of the page, meaning that we've got space for us to think about where we sit, what do we see, and that is a perfect example of how Indigenous graphic novels are not something new, they draw upon uh, a great long traditions of literature that have always been in this place. Um, if we look at the petroforms of the white shell, for example, to bring it home a little bit, we can see that on written on the texts of the very land itself are 
our stories, our narratives, our theories about this place, which talk about how we live in this place and how it is that we are to, uh, what are the instructions necessary to live in this place? And as we visit these, we then stand in the gutter ourselves or we stand in the space in between these texts and think, how is it that we relate? What are the stories that we need to tell? And this is my favorite story of them all. This is called The Path of Life, which is the petroform in the white shell um, of Manitoapi. And it talks about how it is that we come together. It's a really story about treaty. It's how paths come together and what's created as a result and what's left behind. But then when that path comes together, it's, it's a path in which we partake in a partnership, always living together. And I could talk a little bit about other graphic texts that are in operation throughout North America. And I could talk about visual art and, and uh, beautiful paintings and so on. Uh, you know, I've written a lot about this piece right here and I've actually, you know, talk a lot about this piece in the Manitoba Museum and Daphne Ojig's two pieces here. One of the greatest things uh, is uh, Indigenous graphic novels are so innovative that even when Indigenous artists are doing sequential art, these are two paintings, one is in Pegwa's First Nation, the other one's in the Manitoba Museum, there's a gap of around 250 kilometers. Um, she's talking about the flood of Manitoba and the birth of life in Manitoba, but also the colonization of Manitoba and what we do about it. This is called the Great Flood. And this is called the creation of the world. And if you know the story of the muskrat that creates the world, uh, you know the story of what I'm talking about here. But the amazing thing is, is that she puts the beginning of the story in Penguin's First Nation, and then the, uh, not the end of the story, but the conclusion of that version of the story in Man the Manitoba Museum. So literally everybody who lives in that space between those two images is literally living in the comic itself or in the graphic story itself, the sequential art itself. It's a pretty remarkable uh, thing that we're going to be talking about for today. And so uh, when we talk about uh, graphic novels, though, uh, we haven't always had the most uh, positive of representations. Uh, we've had, um, for instance, many really problematic representations of Indigenous peoples throughout time. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Sean Carlton, who's going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and I can see that's asked to unmute. Okay. Do you, you have to jump out and then come back in, I guess. <laughs> are, you, are you on there? You have to unmute yourself now. There you go. Um, well, thanks. Thanks so much, Nigan. Um, it's so lovely to see all of you. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the technical uh, innovations that we've had to make uh, on the fly uh, certainly allow us to, to put on events like this. And it, it really is a... It is a an honor to, to be speaking with everybody. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Oh, um, can you make me a, a co-host, Nigan? Yes, doing it right now. Okay, should do it now. Let me see. Okay. We can see you, we can see your stuff if you're, yeah. yeah. There you go, does that, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it great, yeah. Perfect. Okay, well, uh, my name is Sean Carlton. Uh, I'm a settler historian here at the University of Manitoba in the departments of history and native studies. And while much of my scholarly work and publications have looked at the history of schooling and settler colonialism, I'm also a scholar of, as well as an author, uh, in the medium of comics and graphic novels. Uh, I publish four graphic histories to date and I'm a co-founder of the Graphic History Collective. Uh, and I frequently use comics in my history and Indigenous studies classrooms uh, as an educator. So I'm really honored to be helping organize this symposium uh, and be in dialogue with all of you and the amazing speakers and creators we've assembled today. So what I wanna do with my time is build on uh, Negan's comments uh, and introduce you to how Indigenous peoples fit into uh, the history of, uh, of illustration, uh, history of comics, and graphic novels. And then introduce you briefly to some specific Indigenous titles that I engage uh, and teach with, and that I'm sure will come up again and again over the course of the day. So if Nigon uh, outlined how comics kind of fit with Indigenous modes of storytelling, I'm going to talk more about the history of comics generally and how Indigenous people fit into that history. So while the origins of the comic book are debatable, 
It is generally agreed that the mixture of words and sequential art, often taking the form of different panels on a printed page, emerged as a distinct artistic medium in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, at the time, standalone political cartoons, first in Europe and then in North America, took hold as an influential art form in newspapers as literacy rates were still quite low and many people did not have the ability to engage with a lengthy newspaper article. But a punchy uh, political cartoon, which combined a small amount of text with an often humorous uh, illustration, conveyed information in a powerfully effective way. And not all of these cartoons were light and fluffy as you might think. Uh, for example, here, this first slide is a political cartoon from 1888 uh, in the Canadian publication called Grip, which calls a, a attention to the consequences of John A. Macdonald's starvation politics as a way of trying to contain indigenous resistance to Western colonization around the same time that he's opening the first residential school. So this is a, cr a critique of John A. Macdonald's starvation politics in his own time in illustrated form. So we've got John A. Macdonald here conducting some shady business with a fat cat contractor while uh, deliberately starving indigenous peoples by withholding rations. And the Christian statesman uh, is, is sort of uh, pointing out the hypocrisy of Macdonald in his own time in illustrated form to a Canadian audience. Uh, so some of these uh, early illustrations actually were quite cr critical, even though, as you can see, uh, they engage in racist stereotype and, and, and representation. So let's get that off the screen. Um, inspired by these political, these early political cartoons, artists began creating comic strips for Sunday editions of newspapers by the early 20th century. And by the 1930s, especially in the United States, comics had become an established medium primarily for children and adolescents, but with some popular appeal for adults as well. But it was really the invention of the superhero genre in the 1930s and 1940s, specifically Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman that launched the comic book into the mainstream. And while the superhero genre was certainly the most popular, it's what most people think of when they think of comic books, there were other genres uh, that were quite popular. Uh, uh, including uh, the Western genre that included titles such as The Lone Ranger uh, and Warpath. Uh, and most of these comics represented indigenous peoples in pretty stereotypically racist ways uh, that I don't need to, to go into detail about. It was not until the 1970s and 1980s that indigenous people were brought in from the margins of the comic book universe. And you started to see new characters like Apache Chief, uh, Shaman and Dawn Star. But still, for the most part, uh, these new titles uh, were being created by white artists for overwhelmingly white audiences. And these are mostly US titles. So quickly, how does Canada fit into this? Uh, in Canada, Indigenous people did not figure very prominently in early comics. Um, Inuit played a minor, minor role in, in the famous 1940s run of Nelvana of the Northern Lights. Uh, where Nirvana plays a northern goddess looking out for Inuit in the environment. Uh, there was in the middle here uh, a 1960s comic called New Trails, created actually by the Department of Indian Affairs uh, to try and promote assimilation to, to youth uh, and, and young adults. Uh, and then in the 1970s, uh, there was uh, Super Shamu, the first indigenous created superhero. Uh, but again, these titles were for the most part uh, short-lived. It was not until the 1990s and early 2000s uh, when comics became mainstream again, uh, that new attention was paid to indigenous peoples in comics. And building on the popularity of, of landmark titles like Art Spiegelman's Mouse, uh, a historical account of Nazism and the horrors of the Holocaust uh, that became a bestseller and won a Pulitzer Prize, the new artists and writers became interested in using the comics medium to tackle a range of more challenging topics. Um, perhaps the most famous among these titles in Canada was Chester Brown's Lou Riel, a comic strip biography. And despite its many obvious problems uh, in terms of representation for anyone who, who's read this particular title, uh, its success did clear the way for many publishers to be interested in getting graphic and having Indigenous authors tell their own stories through the comics medium. Uh, among the most notable 
uh, are Gord Hill's The 500 Years of Resistance comic book, uh, which highlights uh, various examples of indigenous resistance in the Americas, uh, and the work of David Alexander Robinson uh, with the life of Betty Osborne graphic novel and, and Sugar Falls, uh, which deals with um, residential schooling. Uh, and David will be speaking with Negon after this opening plenary uh, as the keynote uh, for today's proceedings. And we'll talk more about the trajectory of his career in comics from the early 2000s to, to today. Uh, I don't want to cut into Kateri's time and our time to discuss and, and take some questions via the chat. Uh, and I'm sure Kateri will talk more about some of her favorite works. Uh, she's also a scholar and a producer of comics. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight a few more titles. Uh, there uh, is Red, uh, Ahida Manga, uh, The Moonshot, uh, Indigenous Comics Collection, uh, The Outside Circle, Katharina Vermette's A Girl Called Echo series, uh, and of course, This Place, um, which will be showcased uh, this evening as part of our roundtable event. And these are some of the works that I uh, work with in my classroom. And I know there are a lot of, of, of teachers out there joining us uh, this morning. And I think you know, we can have really fruitful conversations over the course of the day about how these Indigenous comics can really be used uh, in the work that we do across so many uh, disciplines and, and areas. So all of these works and, and many, many more are part of a growing Indigenous comic scene uh, that we are hoping to highlight and shine a spotlight on today. Uh, from more independent comics by Tasha Spillett and Natasha Donovan, uh, to the work of illustrators like Carl Charles uh, working with Marvel Comics. There are many exciting creators in the field today and I'm really honored to have the opportunity to work with Negon and Kateri and Lucas with the Graphic Narratives Research Cluster to help put on this event and, and bring us into conversation today about Indigenous comics. Okay, I'll pass things on to Kateri. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming today. It's really um, such a thrill to see so many people here and uh, uh, to be able to see this event come to fruition. Um, I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank my co-hosts uh, for working so diligently on this and, uh, and especially the University of Toronto, Scarborough, Department of English, U of M, Highwater Press, Kigedos Press, everyone who uh, was involved in in uh, promoting and helping to bring this event to you today. So um, I'm actually relatively new to the study of comics and graphic novels, which is part of the reason why I, uh, I thought that event, an event like this would be helpful in bringing us together uh, so that we could talk about uh, indigenous comics, um, indigenous graphic novels, and, and uh, begin to share information and ideas around that. So I was really happy to hear Nigan's presentation and Sean's presentation. Um, my interest in graphic novels started um, back in the 90s. Uh, I was living in my community uh, where I still live part-time at the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation, uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation in Ontario. And uh, one of our community members uh, was researching our, our treaties um, part of a project that she was doing, uh, fishing rights had become a huge issue in our community. Uh, there was a lot of um, violence from outside our community related to that. And so she began doing this project where she would research various aspects of the treaties. And um, she created little comic strips that went into our community newsletter. Um, her name is Polly Kijik Tobias. And so I followed those for a while. Uh, I'd get them in the mail and I'd see these little comic strips, uh, very informative. And eventually she, she created a graphic novel from that, an illustrated history of the Chippewas of Nawash, which I believe came out in 1996. So I think it's a fairly early example of a graphic novel. Um, uh, it was recording community history. Um, it was used um, um, in part, uh, the motivation was to uh, convey information to community members, first and foremost, about our own history, our own treaties, but also the intent was to use it as an educational tool 
for surrounding communities so that they could learn about that history as well. So that was uh, um, an early influence on me in terms of my interest in graphic novels and understanding how Indigenous people might um, be able to uh, you know, use that form in a way that while not unique to Indigenous people, arose out of the needs and interests and histories of Indigenous people. Um, the next graphic novel that I was aware of actually came from a Maori writer, Robert Sullivan, who um, is a friend of mine and gave me a copy of his graphic novel, Maui, Legends of the Outcast. Um, it was illustrated by a non-Maori uh, illustrator named Chris Slane. And, um, uh, it was one of the earliest, again, uh, Indigenous graphic novels that I was aware of. And uh, it shares cultural stories and, and uh, um, uh, knowledge from Maori people, um, but also the language. The, the language is um, very um, prevalent in the story. And uh, I always uh, tell people about uh, a funny story that happened uh, in relation to that book, because I think um, it's what really cemented for me, I guess, the, the um, ability of graphic novels to communicate uh, in ways that other uh, forms of literature do not. So I had the, a copy of this graphic novel. I had my young nephew visiting me one time. This was uh, many years ago. I think he was about seven at the time. Um, we had been out um, uh, foraging and gathering, I can't remember at the time what it was at the time, but maybe um, wild leeks or, or uh, fiddleheads. And um, he was, we were playing and doing other things. And then I had something I had to do. And so I left him um, watching television or something and, and went into the kitchen and I don't know, I was cooking or whatever. And uh, after a while, I realized he was extremely quiet. So if any of you have small children or have had to take care of small children, uh, you probably know that when children become really quiet for a long period of time, that uh, sometimes that's not so good. Um, he was either being really, really well behaved or something was going on. So I went to check on him and I found him in my room he was sitting on my bed and he had that book, Maui, um, and he was totally engrossed in it. He knew nothing about Maori people. He knew nothing about the Maori language, which was very predominant in the story. And um, he was just wrapped. He was just engrossed in it. And he was not a child who particularly liked to read. And so as a result of that, I thought, okay, there's also something that's speaking to this young indigenous boy that's in this uh, graphic novel, um, even though it's not from our people, there's something that is really resonating with him. And ever since then, I've been wanting to publish and create and learn more about Indigenous graphic novels. Um, so I'm kind of coming here today, uh, like many of you, as, as somebody who's um, also just um, curious. I, I bring a lot of curiosity, I bring a lot of questions. I don't have a lot of answers. I haven't been studying. Uh, indigenous graphic novels for a long time. I did teach a course last term, which led me to proposing this event um, and taking it to the chair of my department and asking if we could get funding for it because I recognized that there was a need for thinkers, creators, um, people interested in indigenous graphic novels to come together to uh, to discuss this form and and you know what a, in what ways is um, is it Indigenous and how are Indigenous graphic novels um, different? Well, as Nigon has already um, spoken about briefly, um, and as I also <laughs> taught in my course, Indigenous graphic novels come out of, of our own history of um, oral and written forms of storytelling and, and uh, ways of conveying uh, language and history and teachings and so on. Um, as well as just stories. So um, right now, um, Indigenous graphic novels seem to be exploding. There is just a lot of people becoming engaged in uh, the writing and creating and reading of 
of um, Indigenous graphic novels and comics, uh, which I find really exciting. Um, I think more and more of us are teaching Indigenous graphic novels, and I think um, from what I've seen, this place, 150 Years Retold, which we'll be showcasing uh, this evening, is one of those texts that is being taught quite a bit. Um, the other things that I think are exciting that are happening right now, um, there, there are many series, and Sean um, listed some of those, but there are series of, of graphic novels and comics that we're seeing that are, um, you know, that are continuing by people like uh, Katharina Vermette, um, David Alexander Robertson, uh, Tasha Spillett Sumner, who will be with us this afternoon, um, Neil Shanacapo, uh, Kikadose Press has just published his first in a series of graphic novels, um, and there are many others as well uh, that are that are coming along. Um, so I find I find that fascinating. And what's interesting to me is that there are small presses um, and self-publishing that's happening uh, for Indigenous comics as well as graphic novels, <clears throat> which um, which is bringing it to large and small audiences across uh, Turtle Island. Um, I'm really interested in the work of an up and coming um, comic uh, creator and graphic novel creator called um, Cole Pauls, uh, who is an award-winning writer. I believe he won an, an Indigenous Voices Award. I think it was last year. Um, he was nominated for a Doug Wright Comic Award uh, for um, uh, Dakota Warriors, uh, which uh, makes a point of using and um, highlighting uh, indigenous language within it, which I find really interesting. Um, uh, so I'm interested to find out more today. I think the, the recent Marvel Indigenous Voices um, uh, Volume 1, which came out late in 2020, is a really interesting step in this journey. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, from what I've seen, uh, DC Comics is also doing some things. Um, they did a, um, um, a collection which in, there was one comic which uh, featured um, an Indigenous woman which was written by um, an Indigenous uh, woman writer and which used the illustrations of uh, Natasha Donovan who will also be here this afternoon. So there's lots of interest coming from all areas in terms of Indigenous comics and graphic novels. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the day to be able to talk with you, uh, talk with my um, co-organizers, and uh, just learn more about what is really happening out there, um, who's doing what, who's studying what, who's teaching what, who's interested in what. And um, I I'm really grateful to have all of you here. I hope you'll be able to join us throughout the day on this, uh, on this journey and, and to hear these amazing creators share their work, share their interests, and hopefully answer some of the questions that you might have that you've brought with you today. So um, Chimi Gwech to all of you, and I look forward to seeing you throughout the day today. So Miigwech, Kateri, and Sean for those uh, kind of introductions to different elements of Indigenous graphic novels, uh, Indigenous comics. And, uh, you know, I think it's important that when we chose the name for the event, we chose comics because, uh, frankly, that's the thing that I grew up with. That's the thing that uh, I think a lot of our people use. Uh, and I also think that it's important to, uh, to sort of repossess that word a little bit, even though graphic novels is obviously, I think, has become, uh, you know, people say, what's the difference between graphic novels and comics? And really, the difference is the price, you know, like it's, or sometimes the, the way it's bound, you know, it's more graphic novels are more, are more, um, like kind of, they're more kind of hard covery kind of things like like this and then comic books tend to be a bit more of a kind of a soft cover, like a soft cover kind of thing like this. And so you can see I have a whole bunch of them behind me and uh, I keep, I mean, that really that's my main form of uh, literature. I, I read poetry and, and uh, novels, of course, and same thing with Cattery and with Sean, but I read so much graphic novels because you could read it in an afternoon. You know, you could read one in an entire afternoon. You could you could read an entire series uh, in a re relatively short amount of time and have really great conversations. Like I teach a course called uh, Sovereign Traces uh, and, and 
in the summertime, I can do an entire course with about a dozen books in a week, which is, you just can't do that with any other, you can't do, you know, 12 poetry anthologies or 12 novels in a week. You just kill yourself with all the reading alone. But uh, we're going to invite other people to make a, you know, into this conversation. We've got a whole bunch of people, really amazing people, and a lot of really amazing graphic novelists who have joined us who are in the audience right now. And uh, feel free to you know, put up your hand if you want. Um, we've got some security settings just due to some uh, issues that have happened at the University of Manitoba campus. Um, so we've got to, you know, we've got to be a little bit more uh, secure in the delivery of this day today. We want to make sure that everyone has a safe place to, to converse and to discuss. And, uh, but I just want to give some kudos to some amazing people who are here right now. So Catherine Gerbassi is one of our partners in the event. Uh, she's the publisher of High Water Press, and so she's here. Uh, I can also see David Robertson is here, who's going to be with us uh, via a recording, even though he's, uh, he's sort of in the audience over there. He's actually texting me right now, so, uh, so I know he's in the audience as well. And I can't really, you know, go through everybody who's here, but I also see my friend Donovan, who's one of the uh, most um, remarkable colorists uh, in Canada who's doing amazing stuff with supporting. Uh, he's in, he just, he just a remarkable guy generally. Uh, I also see Camille Callison, uh, who is uh, one of the founders of the Mazda Biege collection, the Indigenous Graphic Novel Collection at the University of Manitoba Libraries. Um, if you want to get a chance to check out something really cool, which is happening at the University of Manitoba, it's the uh, <laughs> uh, the Indigenous Graphic Novel Collection that we have. I think it's the only one in a university in Canada. I know there's a number of Indigenous Graphic Novel Collections out there, but I think it's the only one in a university in Canada. So Camille, uh, Camille's here as well, and, and she's one of the founders of that library collection. And just a whole bunch of other people who are here, uh, really awesome, great people. I'm just scrolling to the list and going, oh gosh, all these people that, I wish I could all see you right now, physically. Uh. Patricia Campbell is here as well from Kiganos Press. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Patricia's here. And uh, oh, that brings us to uh, the giveaways. So let's not forget about the giveaways that are happening throughout today. So our first giveaway is happening uh, right now. So if you want to go out and you want to uh, have an opportunity to get your first giveaway for attending for today, uh, do we want to invite uh, Patricia to come and uh, give our giveaway the first giveaway from Kiganon's Press? Sure. She's muted at the moment. but uh... is, it, is it Patricia Roach? Patricia Patricia Campbell is Patricia Campbell. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I see her right there. I am her? moving okay. her. I've asked to unmute her right now. So and I will actually make Hi. great. There you are. And you oh, see me? <laughs> yeah, there you are. Great. And I will uh, I'll add you to the spotlight here, Patricia. So uh, do you want to give a do you want to give a giveaway right now? Pardon me? You want to make a giveaway right now from Kagadon's Press for every anyone who's attended and Yes, so we are giving away a copy or several copies over the day of uh, The Krillian Key, uh, Salamander Run, which is volume one of The Krillian Key by Neil Shanakapo. We published uh, this book in November last year. Um, so Kateri, how are we working the giveaway? Well, for this one, let's just say uh, the first person to put their name in the chat will get the first copy. Right, excellent. <laughs> oh. There we go. <laughs> although, although I, uh, they're sending direct messages to me. Maybe that's their only choices. So, um, yeah, sure I can't see the everyone I see, option myself. Okay, I see uh, Jeremy. Did what did you see? I uh, that let's go with Jeremy. So, okay, okay. Um, so Jeremy, Jeremy, I'm gonna uh... Jeremy Carnes. Um, you can contact Patricia to um, claim your copy of uh, the Krillian Key. And uh, that will be sent out to you. That will be mailed out to you. So we'll need your mailing address. Um, Patricia, do you want to, are you able to, are they able to message each other? No, they- I'm not able to post. Settings, yeah. Okay, so um, Jeremy, I'll get your information from you. Uh, I have to leave in a few minutes, but I'll get your information from you right now. If you could uh, message me your mailing address, we'll, I'll pass that along to Patricia and we'll get that book out to you. So I apologize, everybody. We're just sort of figuring out the technological part, but due to, <laughs> yes. a, uh, due to, due to some security issues, uh, we're going to have to handle the, the chat through, well, through the chat. So you, you can send it to me and I'll present the question to the panelists. And, uh, um, but I want to, you know, give everyone a voice as well. And, and so I'll say your name if that's okay. So uh, Elaine is asking, she's a children's author. She's been working on a graphic novel for about two years now. 
Uh, she's been looking for an Indigenous illustrator. Will there, will there be an opportunity to meet illustrators? I mean, it's kind of impossible on a day like this. However, uh, there are Indigenous graphic novel illustrators out there. There's not many, however. Uh, many people are uh, overbooked, and, and but you'll meet some of them on the afternoon panel, uh, on the Marvel Comics panel. And I think also, yeah, we, Natasha Donovan will be here as well. And so, you know, really amazing illustrators. You'll be able to hear some of their work. So that'll be at 12, uh, make sure I get my time, central time always, 12.30 and 2 o'clock, right? 1.30. 1.30? 12.30 and 1.30? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. And you, you can imagine uh, there's too many balls in the air and we're trying to handle Eastern <laughs> time zone and central time zone. So, um, yeah, so check out the schedule. Uh, and so... The, uh, there's, Barb is saying, if, for those of you that are interested in looking at the Mazna Bige collection, uh, you can type in Mazna Bige, it's spelled M-A-Z-I-N-B-I-I-G-E. And uh, if I get a chance here, I could always uh, kind of uh, uh, open it up and sort of take a look here. Um, <clears throat> check out the Mazna Bige collection. Um, there is a, Margaret is asking, uh, and maybe Kateri, I can throw this at you, uh, do you know some graphic novels that are suitable for students in elementary settings? I'm, I'm thinking about the Tales from Big Spirit series, which is with uh, High Water Press by David Robertson. It's about Indigenous heroes, and it's about, um, they're really based towards sort of a grade five, six, seven level. Uh, do you know of any others? Um, honestly, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I think that's a good one that you've just mentioned. Yeah, the, the Tales from Big Spirit series is a pretty cool series. We, co we cover it in the David Robertson uh, hour that we spend with them where we talk a little bit about that particular series. It's seven books. It's also seven books that are in kind of Canada. And then there's also a new series that he created that's with Newfoundland. And so you can see Indigenous heroes from Newfoundland, which are pretty cool as well. Uh, uh, Eric is asking, what are the best ways for non-Indigenous authors and artists to amplify Indigenous voices in their own creative work? I think, Kateri, that's an amazing question for you. So I'll throw that at you. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Jeremy was just messaging me in the chat. Oh. So I missed part of that question. <laughs> uh, what are the best ways for non-Indigenous authors and artists to amplify Indigenous voices in their own creative work? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, think, I think I'm gonna start from the opposite end, I guess, in a way, which is um, uh, to just, um, not assume an Indigenous voice in your work. So we, you know, we, I would encourage you to avoid that. But if, you, if you're looking for ways to um, make people aware, I think there's lots of opportunities when you're, um, when you're uh, out in the public to make people aware of um, Indigenous authors whose works might be similar to yours or in the same genre as yours. Um, within the, the work itself. I have a colleague at, uh, at UTSC um, who is including a land acknowledgement in her upcoming novel uh, to be published. And as part of that, she is encouraging people to go and read uh, specific uh, Indigenous authors who she is recommending to her readers. So I thought that was a really um, great way for her to, to highlight and, and spotlight other um, Indigenous writers and their works. So, so a couple of, uh, couple of ideas for you to uh, how you might be able to do that in a good way. I'm just posting the, uh, uh, while you're doing that, Nigan, could I talk just a little bit about uh, elementary education? Oh, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Comics. I mean, I see David Alexander Robinson there, and, and I've done a lot of work with uh, social studies teachers and trying to find ways to include uh, graphic works um, and, and some librarians, which I know we have quite a few librarians out there. Um, and, and I've had a lot of, of um, positive response to a lot of what David Alexander Robinson, uh, Scott A. Henderson have done, things like Sugar Falls, right, facilitating uh, age appropriate conversations about residential schooling. Um, the kind of hero series, sorry, I know I've got a background on there, but this is the, the rebel uh, Gabriel Dumont. Um, and, and a lot of those works are really rich because uh, they're both visually appealing and, and the narrative is age appropriate in terms of both educating and, you know, uh, allowing, um, you know, young children uh, and, and, and young adults to really kind of get into 
uh, the comics medium uh, that are not necessarily like a Garfield um, or you know other kinds of comics. You know, it, they're they're dealing with more serious subjects, um, but in a way that allows them to to get engaged uh, with the medium and the story. So for for folks looking for age appropriate uh, materials, I would absolutely recommend those as a good starting place. I. Uh you know what, Sean wins today for just making a Garfield reference. <laughs> hey, I, I like Garfield too. I mean, you know, there's all different kinds of, of, of comics. And I mean, one of the things perhaps that we can talk about over the course of the day as we speak to some of these amazing speakers is I'm always interested in, you know, how, you know, you get into comics or, or how you come to that medium. Um, oh, that's, I mean, that's amazing. I grew up on Calvin and Hobbes. Anybody remember Calvin and Hobbes? Uh, it was a huge moment for me and when I was, you know, I remember it was one of the first, first comic strips that I would actually really be appealed to and I'd really like turn to the pages and read them and that kind of thing. And um, the, uh, I, I just want to say I'm posting in the chat here uh, a couple things. First is the uh, contact for the Mazda Be Gay collection. The second that I'm posting is the uh, Candida Rifkin's uh, indigenous comics uh, sort of compendium. Uh, it's the it com the annotated bibliography, which is a remarkable job. Way to go, Candida. You're gonna meet Candida tonight, who's hosting our, our This Place panel. Um, and then I've also posted the uh, uh, some information from Judith. Thanks, Judith, for letting us know about the Healthy Aboriginal Network, who are doing some incredible stuff with comic books. Much of it is uh, available in really chunky samples or sometimes the entire book on their website you can see so if you're looking if you're a teacher out there and you're teaching a class and you want basically a free resource they they provide that they ask that you provide a support for the the network of course but they they it is something very useful that they want young people to read around things like sexual health and uh uh, staying in school and positive self-image and those kinds of things really amazing comic books that you can see with the healthy aboriginal network um, uh, Kateri, uh, there, someone's being asked, uh, asking new direct questions saying that, um, how, how should, should, should people just not include Indigenous characters in their stories? Uh, that seems like almost an erasure though. It seems like, uh, like you don't want to write a story about anything involving like Treaty 1 territory without talking about Treaty 1 people, right? Right. No, I, I, I don't recommend that at all either, um, because of course we're we're here in our homelands. We're here in a huge diaspora, um, and uh, I, I don't think that ignoring indigenous people is the answer either. It's more about um, assuming indigenous perspectives. Um, so writing main characters, for example, um, that that are indigenous. I think um, they're, you know, it's I, I. Some people say just don't do it at all. I think that the, that um, you know it would require a considerable amount of research and and labor and understanding um, of of the history and the people and the language and um, various other things to be able to to do that in a realistic way. And as soon as you put a character like that out there, then of course you're open to um, criticism from people from within those communities. So I, I, I suggest, um, you know, that Indigenous people should be seen as part of Indigenous, um, as part of other literatures um, in the same way that any other people in Turtle Island would be. Um, but I think it's, no matter what it is, I think it's, it's always um, uh, challenging to try to write from a perspective um, that's not your own and where you don't have sufficient knowledge to to be able to make the assumptions that come along with creating a, a character. Um, we're, as we as we uh, wrap up here, um, I'm going to uh, uh, ask uh, Kirsten Phillips from the High Water Press. Uh, I know that she's just joined us. Um, High Water Press is also doing some giveaways for today. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of transition right now to our uh, keynote in a, in a few minutes. So for the next 15 minutes or so, we're gonna keep the room uh, open. We're gonna do some technical things. So I'm not sure, Sean, do you wanna put people in the waiting room while we figure out the Facebook issue? Yeah, um, probably. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna stop the recording right now, just so that because, uh, but I'm gonna say huge miigwech to everybody for joining us for the plenary. And- uh, Thank you, the, for, for The first beginning. And you know, I think it was almost seamless, you know, that's figuring out the tech issues. And so I really appreciate a uh, huge thanks to Lucas 
I can see Lucas up in the corner of your screen there, who's just working very hard to help us keep in with our tech, and we're endlessly kind of sending messages to each other. We're going to come back in 15 minutes uh, to hear David Robertson's keynote. Uh, it's a conversation on his career and all the different elements of some uh, you know, really amazing talk uh, information that you're going to hear about uh, David's influences on how some of the comic books that he's writing today and some of the innovative forms that he's, he's investigating. So, and also why he did certain comic books in certain ways. It's a pretty cool talk. So check mm -hmm. it out. Uh, we'll, we'll be see you here right back here in 15 minutes. Um, I'm we'll trying to figure out Kirsten. So I see you out there. I was trying to get you to come on here to give a giveaway, but we'll maybe wait till David Robertson's talk in order to get you on there. So, uh, so we let you everybody. We'll see you in 15 minutes. I'm stopping the recording.